Hello, this is one of our series of short videos about the Charity Commission, which is the regulator of charities in England and Wales. My name's Rachel McCastman. I'm a solicitor at Russell Cook in our charity and social business team, as well as a charity trustee. I'm here today with my colleague, James Sinclair Taylor, who's a partner in the charity and social business team and has decades of experience advising charities on governance and other legal issues, as well as being a trustee and chair of many charities. Today, I will be quizzing James about how to prepare for a possible compliance visit from the Charity Commission. So James, I thought I'd start by asking you, what is the Charity Commission kind of focusing on at the moment in terms of compliance visits? Well, I wish there was a dead simple answer of that, but it does vary a bit. Um, they have just routine visits occasionally, particularly they pick a subgroup, um, a working group in the Commission decides to look at. The bigger you are, the more likely you are to get a visit. Um, they certainly have been following up on their regulatory alerts. They've been talking uh, more and more about their regulatory alerts being something which if trustees ignore, uh, they're going to be seriously considering that there's something going wrong in the organisation. And um, so um, they visited out, um, a number of charities following their regulatory alert of June last year, and uh, they're going to, I think, continue that uh, practice. And finally, um, there, um, th there are issues that may be specific to your, not necessarily your charity, but your sector. They may be worrying about a subsector because um, they've had some major concern or investigation relating to it. Um, or it may be uh, an issue relating to a particular issue. Uh, uh, in the investigation of kids' company, they were very worried about levels of reserves. So you might find a, a, a very focused investigation just looking at your reserves policy. I think reserves is a particularly topical one at the moment, isn't it? Because of the pandemic and charities are really struggling with reserves at the moment. Yes, it's a bit of a worry, actually, because um, the judge in the insolvency procedures um, affecting kids' company said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the behaviour of, of the trustees and the public didn't need protecting from them. Uh, and the Commission, in its own investigation, took the contrary view that there was misconduct because uh, the shorter, when they were short of cash, they didn't always pay all their creditors on time. Um, so you're getting rather different messages from the Commission and from um, the courts. And there's quite a lot of kind of different areas you've mentioned at the beginning there. So is there any particular areas that at the moment the Commission is really, really focusing on? Um, I think the... Uh, work they did with the Royal National Institute for Blind uh, about trustee oversight uh, has definitely been an area where they've been having regulatory visits. And they're looking at uh, governance, risk management, um, complaints, and uh, safeguarding particularly. So you need to be prepared, particularly in those fields. And when I say prepared, what I mean is um, you've got not only to have some policies um, but th they better not be policies that have been in the back drawer for a very long time and not been reviewed. They'll be looking to see that the board has actually looked at them when they looked at them. They'll look at the minutes showing that there was um, a, a review of those policies. And you mentioned safeguarding there as a particular focus. Why do you think that is? I think the uh, Commission has uh, expanded greatly the idea of what safeguarding is from its original concept, which was protecting children and vulnerable adults, uh, to protecting anyone who has contact with the charity. And that could be a volunteer, that could be a staff member, uh, it could be somebody who literally walked in through the door and felt that they hadn't been properly treated by your receptionist. Um, and so it's become a sort of major focus of their work. And as a result of that, they've lift, uh, issued um, a number of things that are very important that you need to look at in preparing for um, a regulatory review. First of all is detailed guidance as to uh, what the board needs to do to show that it's on top of um, safeguarding. Um, and uh, the second is uh, ensuring that safeguarding arrangements and com associated complaints are very accessible to people. So first thing they'll do is look at your website and say, couldn't see a reference to um, complaints policy there, um, couldn't see it's your safeguarding policy, we have a concern already. And the other one actually is their um, safeguarding guidance has recently been updated 
to talk about online harms. So in terms of websites as well. Absolutely, online harms. And, um, you know, just f for those who haven't looked at the guidance, which has changed quite a bit as to what is a safeguarding issue, uh, it includes um, allegations of harassment or bullying inside the organisation if it affected senior staff or uh, affected reputation. Um, so safeguarding is a, is a very big topic now and remains so. And what about serious incidents? Well, I know that you're going to do a session on serious incidents and look at it in a great deal of detail, but um, safeguarding serious incidents very closely linked and um, the need to report issues quickly is closely linked. So you absolutely need a serious incident reporting policy uh, to enable your charity to report between board meetings if there's something urgent and you need to be clear right through the organisation from top to bottom that people understand what needs to be brought forward as a possible serious incident. So something might happen in a branch or a, a project some way from head office. It's vital that the information about what the problem was makes it up through the management hierarchy to the, um, through the staff team to the trustees for a decision to be made at that level as to whether it's um, appropriate to report it or not. And in terms of those key concerns, do you see those changing at any point or do they tend to be quite consistent over the years? Um, I think th there is change and we've talked before about how the Commission's agenda is often driven by media concern or political concern. Um, and so um, we have seen a move from initial concerns about being on top of fundraising. Um, so a board would still need to be able to demonstrate that it was really aware of the issues relating to fundraising, for example, using external uh, funding partners, fundraising partners. Um, it moved on with the Oxfam thing to safeguarding. Um, it's moved on again with RNIB to um, communications between the board and um, the uh, staff and in ensuring that there is really good risk management. So risk management, I think, have moved right up the agenda to it being a very important tool and the Commission wanting me to be able to see evidence that it is being treated in a serious way and that steps are being taken as a result of it. Um, so it, it is a moving area, but uh, it, it, I'm afraid ten, each time a new area crops up, it doesn't actually displace the previous one. It simply adds to the pile. Yeah, absolutely. And what can charities do to prepare for a possible compliance visit? I think they need to think in these key areas, do we have policies which we are confident have been prepared uh, in compliance with the Commission's guidance, which are up to date, which have been looked at um, by the board or at the very least by a subcommittee, uh, and which we um, uh, can show that are available to the public or whoever they're relevant to. So um, a lot of the work we do is in helping people prepare for Commission uh, visits. The, the problem is that they come at quite short notice. Um, and um, if you're given two or three weeks or perhaps a month notice of a commission visit, that's not much time to put in place policies. So you really have to get them in place now. And you really need um, to have a, a hierarchy of um, the importance of policies. So if we said safeguarding was up at the top of your list and perhaps risk management, down at the bottom might be I don't know, uh, an expenses policy for trustees. You need one, but hopefully it won't need to be updated more than every four or five years, whereas the others um, should, will need more often updated. And finally, is there anything else I haven't asked you about already that you think would be helpful to share? I think it's the fundamental. Um, everything a charity does is based on its constitution, whether it's a royal charter or whether it's more commonly a company limited by guarantee or CIO. And there you have an objects clause, which often gets rather forgotten because you have a, a mission statement which is perhaps drawn from it. And you do need to think, are we still able to justify everything we do as being firstly in the public benefit and secondly, well within our objects? And going down the constitution from the objects, which is obviously the most important, are we sure that we are actually following the right procedures in appointing members to the organisation? 
uh, holding elections, appointing trustees. Surprising number of organisations when they have a regulatory visit, the Commission says, but I don't really understand how these people came to be trustees, so there doesn't seem to be any minutes of any meetings um, appointing them in the way that was required by your constitution. Well, thank you so much, James. That's been really interesting. I hope it's been helpful for everyone watching as well. If you do have any questions for me or James, please do feel free to contact us. Our details will be alongside this video as well as on our website. Thank you and goodbye.